I am long stories, but it's very inter more interesting is the time when after the war, when the war started. Mm -hmm. When the war started, I was exactly 18, graduated in 39. Graduated from high school, but I one couldn't get to university because of being Jewish and uh, the Hungarians occupied Czechoslovakia in 1938. So in 1940 I went, I became a soldier, but uh, no soldier, it means a Jewish soldier. Instead of a gun, I had a, a how do you call it? To, to dig. Shovel? Shovel. 1940 to 1944. But in 1942, it's 43, it started to turn around. You know, the Germans were uh, attacked. Russia, and they got beat there. So in 1944, we went behind, we, unit, we our units were going past, uh, behind the army to build bunkers, roads, carry the kitchens to to the front and so on and so on. So we went from one place to another. Of course, there was no, we lived outside under the tree or something. Until 44, when the Russians started to push the Germans back and the Hungarians. And so we were coming back from where I came all the way to Ukraine. Then they started to go back from Ukraine. Ukraine. And uh, oh. the way we cut the river went on the road, the unit went a couple of days, day and night, we slept a few hours. Then I found a cousin of mine who was in another unit. And uh, I escaped from my unit and went to his unit because he was in better shape. His, his uh, commandi, commanding officer was a friend of his. So I had pretty good, uh, I was in pretty good shape until we came to hung Hungary, and not Hungary, yes, to Hungary. And uh, when we came to a small town in Hungary, they decided that we should get a little rest, a couple of days, sleep there, and before we continue to go to well, uh, as a cousin of my friend, my. Because I was had special treatment, of course, and instead of the unit that slept in the church, I slept with a private, with a local guy, house, with a soldier. The soldier and I we slept there, and at night we were sleeping. At night they came, suddenly came to the house. And they say they were uh, partisans. They are partisans, and when we were sleeping, we were on the border between Slovakia and Hungary. So when they came in the house, they came to get the owner, the local guy, to get join the partisans. Then suddenly they saw the gun and they asked, what is it? Is it is a soldier who is. So, and you are M. I am, I said, I am a, a, in a 
a Jewish uh, worker for them. So he said, why don't you come you with us to the partisans? So at night we started to go, all three of us and the partisans, to over to the Slovakia. It went through the forests all night. We walked until the morning uh, early. We arrived to to their place where they were, and we went into. Of course, we got into the first yeah, bar, not bar, restaurant or something, where they gave us food. But I have to mention that before we left, the owner of the house told his wife that in the morning go to the Hungary, Hungarian uh, commandatura and tell them that the partisans made my husband, forced him to go with them, you know. I'm mentioning it because while we were sitting there and eating, suddenly a partisan comes in. The Hungarians are coming, so everybody jumped and got out of this and running back to the forest. And I was tired, I, I said, I cared, whatever happens, happens. I got out and sat behind a big tree, you know, and mm -hmm. sat down. Mm -hmm. And the Hungarians came and they started shooting here and there. I sat behind the tree so that it doesn't hit me. And then it quiet. Then I fell asleep from that. <laughs> I fell asleep and when I woke up quiet, nobody here, no partisan, no Hungarians. I get up and went to the to the first house, asked, where are the partisans? I said the partisans are in the forest. They didn't come back yet. They said we because of the Hungarians they came over to to rescue the soldier, you know. The Germans? Hungarians with the Germans, yeah. they were together they were. Of course. So I don't know what to do. And I decided I go back to the unit. So I started to go again. Your first unit? Or your cousin's unit? Your cousin. Yeah. They were in that. Oh, right. Yeah. And I went through, through the hole back until I arrived to this village where they were and I told my cousin that they forced us to go. I didn't enforce me, but they what happened, and therefore I didn't know what to do. I came back, here was a... But the officer was pretty... was afraid of the partisans, so he, when he heard the whole story, what happened, that they came over, made immediately the unit start to go, continue, out of the village, and... Why we were returning or going back, uh, retreating, like he said, in the war. I was thinking to myself, what do I do with this? What do I go? Where do I go? It's hungry. And I was slowly trailing behind them until they lost them. They went and I stayed behind. From there I was on my own. No. I used to, I went about a few miles, came close to a village, I would go into the village, I told them I lost my unit, and they let me sleep in the barn, they gave me food, and I continued. And this, this I went, continued back about for two weeks, every day I came. Where were you traveling to? Uh -huh. Where were you going to? The same place, what the 
what the retreating was. I went, but I went slowly, uh -huh. you know, hoping maybe the Russians will catch with, up with me if I sleep here. And so until after about two weeks, I came close to a big city, and in front of the big city there were uh, notes on the trees. Anybody who comes, who is a, who escaped from his units, and they catch him, he will be hanged immediately. You know the Hungarian. So I didn't know what to do. But first of all, I went in the first small village, and uh, it was. I forgot to say that. I forgot to say that while I was coming close to, there was a unit uh, where a Hungarian uh, Jewish unit in one of the villages. So I went there. I had enough. I was afraid already. Didn't know what to do. And luckily, again, I found. A, a, a guy from the same town and I am. His father was a doctor. My father bought a house, his house. He built another one. My father, so we knew each other. So I asked him, what do you think? Can I stay with you? Or with? He said, in the meantime, go ahead, sit down. You can eat with us and be with us. But we are waiting for the, for a train that will take us toward, back toward Germany. So I was there about two days when, when uh, the train arrived. Train, it was uh, a, a locomotive, you know, this box, box cars. And I thought, I'm going, what I'm going, I'm going with them. Suddenly he comes to me, he says to me, I told my officer that you are with us and you want to come with us. And he says, says no, you, he cannot. He says, I wish all of you would get away so that I can go home to Budapest, you know, mm -hmm. not get new ones in there. So I had to leave. So then when I went, continued, and then I see these notes, and I went to the first village. And in this village, I went to the one house, got in and told them, I'm hungry and I'm, and uh, if I could stay here. In the meantime, I forgot to tell you that during these two weeks, I didn't have a chance even to wash myself, to clean something clean. I was like, got scabies. I was had lice and scabies all over my back. While I was eating, then suddenly comes in a, a German officer. And uh, He sits down, looks at me, who you are? I had a yellow band on my showing the Jewish. What are you doing here? Luckily, I had a note that I got when I went to my friend there. I told him, make me a note with a, with a stamp, official stamp, that I got lost from my unit and I am following my unit. So I took out this note and showed it to the officer. He didn't know Hungarian, or the way it was written, you know, mm -hmm. but he saw an oh, artificial a stamp, mm -hmm. so he gave it to me. Then I found out that the officer, he has a whole unit of, of uh, uh, Ukrainian soldiers 
that you came over to the Russia to the Germans and they they weren't fighting but they carried carried gasoline and so on. They supplied the war with uh, gas and whatever. So after I ate, I thanked and I left. I didn't want, didn't want to stay there with the office. And continued to the end of the village where I went to another guy, another farmer. Mm -hmm. And told him if I could stay here in your barn and sleep there. He says, fine, you can stay here, you can live with my, come into my house and sleep in my house. I said, thank you. And suddenly started to come Russian planes. You know, a plane was coming, make a, a circle, and another came and threw a bomb through there, you know. And I went to look, went to the border where you know, what is it called? You know, when it's ending to, to the street. Oh, the curb? Not curb, uh, sidewalk. A uh, fence? What? Fence? Fence. Uh, stood there and watched the. Suddenly they start to come the trucks with the gasoline on it. And I'm watching them leaving, and suddenly comes two German police. They have a metal plate in front that showed that they are pol uh, military police, you know. They come through, look at me, who are you? I said, I am uh, working. He says, you come with us. So I had no choice. I start to go with them when another truck comes and they sh showing th them that this is the last. Come to the so so they left to me where, there where and they, they jumped on the truck. Where was the truck going? Yeah, leaving the town, going back also. Really. Okay. Uh, turning, going back. To Hungary, but this was they were in German uniform. This were Germans there, but they were going retreating. And my luck that this was a truck that they jumped, left me there and jumped on the truck, and left no more Germans in that village. Man, Whew. that was very close. Then, of course, I left from there, went to the house of this farmer. He showed me a nice bed, so you can sleep here and do whatever. It was very nice. So I went to bed, I was tired. Went to bed, went to sleep. When about midnight, he comes in and says, the Russians are here. Yeah. Rush say fine, I jump out and get out from the house and suddenly two Russians are there with a gun. And they shout, officer, officer. You see I had a leather leather overcoat that I brought from home and I went to I had this overcoat and Russian uh, leather. The inside was inside it was uh, uh, fur. fur. So they thought that I'm officer because who goes in the Russian army with a leather coat? Only officers in the German army. Oh. So they came to me and my coat was off in the moment. <laughs> And they, I told them I am, I spoke a little Russian because I spoke Czech. I told them I am Jewish. I'm. So they took me, took me to the third or fourth house there, where there was an officer there. He sat there and, you know, he ate was his, 
commandantura. So I, being a Jew, I thought I am, I am saved, I am freed, I am. When and I tell this officer, listen, I had a cold. It is now September. Cold. Your soldiers took it away. So they says to the soldiers, it has to be, it might be that the officer was Jewish. Because he told them right away, take, give him his coat back. You know? So they gave me the coat and they took me to a house, the last house in the village, where they collected the POWs. They were a German that was broke, it was a broken arm. And uh, there were a few, few uh, Hungarians and also POWs. So I remember in that house, I, there was one Russian soldier who was take watching, I, I mean, to care. And I go to the soldier and say, let's, let's leave here because it, I heard about cases when the Russians occupied a, a village or a town, or villages mostly, and suddenly the Germans came and pushed them out, you know, and if they catch, a Jew or a somebody, they shoot him right away. So I wanted him to go back. We started to the Russian, we started to go out. It was already light. And the moment we got out of the house, a German ran away and hid behind. There were uh, grass, not grass, uh, they feed the animals. Hey, hey, hi, hey. So you couldn't see, so he immediately put the, took us back to the house and waited a couple of hours until it got very light, and then we went to the main commandantura. It was, I don't know, some five, ten miles away from the place. We went there. We went there, and the moment we got in, suddenly my coat disappeared. A Russian comes to me. He had a, a leather coat, like a pilot, you know, without, just like this. So he took it off and took mine away and gave me, gave me the other one. <laughs> and the second took the other one from me, you know. <laughs> so I had no coat again. So then I... Came, they, they collected, they collected all the POWs and they were going to take POWs to the POW camp, which was, I don't know, it took us a week to get there by foot. But I told them, what do you want from me? I am a Jew, I didn't, I'm not uh, against the Russian. It doesn't matter, he said, the Russian. You worked for the Germans. So you helped them in the war, you had POW. So I went with the POWs, I had no choice. There were two Russians, these little ponies, going, watching us and going. And of course they didn't give food, nothing. The only food that I could find, if I, here and there I found, we found a, that German, they always had some bread in the... Uh, oh, no. And it was a kind of bread, like you say, you buy here, that stays soft, you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, so that... So we had this bread in the evenings, used to sit behind, made a fire and sit there and maybe toast the bread or something. But it took about a week to get to the POW camp, which was in mid Hungary. When we arrived to the POW camp, they told us to stand in line and the officer, a Russian officer came out and looked, looked at us and said, who is sick? Stand out. 
So there was a German guy with a broken arm that had a sling. And I don't, I don't remember how many, but I stood up also. So he comes to me, what's your problem? So I lifted my, my shirt and showed him my back, who was all raw, you know, from scabies. He said, uh, face and, and go. And uh, then there were some four or five people sick. And of course he couldn't take us to the crema camp to get somebody with a contagious disease. So he told us, you go to the, command, to the town, Commandatura. They took us to the Commandatura, to the town. I don't remember what was the name of the, of the town, where the POW camp was outside the town. We came there and there was the officer, the headquarters, you know. He comes out, an officer from there, looks at us and he says in Yiddish, go heim kinderlach, go home children, you know. He didn't say he was a Jewish officer. So we happily started to go to the railroad station, you know, mm -hmm. to go home. You come to the railroad station and then Russian soldiers, they pushing uh, uh, steel barrels with gasoline up to, to, to the train to, uh, to carry it, to take it somewhere. And it was cold. Mm -hmm. And he comes to us, what are you doing? He says, waiting for the... Suddenly he comes to us, he says, a train is leaving now. Go, jump. So we left and jumped on the train, you know. Wow. Very lucky. And it went, I went on the train all the way down to Debrecen. Debrecen, it was the place where my sister used to live. She, she got married with a, with a doctor in Debrecen and my father b bought a big house there for them. And I, I came to Debrecen, I thought I'll go and see them. And I go, got out, go to the house. There was a janitor a house, a small house in the yard that the janitor lived in because my sister and my her son and her husband were taken to Auschwitz and were killed or killed. But the janitor knew me because I was visiting them before. And he opened the door and let me in in the house. It was the whole apartment, beautifully furnished. And, uh, but you had to be afraid because not to get too much out because the Russians used to pick up people, civilians. If they, for example, they got, they don't know, 10 POWs to take somewhere to work and somebody escaped, you know, or to, then they just picked from the street some Take civilian them. and put them, go, go with them. So I was there for a day, I think, or two, and then I went to the railroad station again and got home to Umgar, to Ushvarod. I come there and the first thing, I went to a cousin of mine because I knew that my parents were also taken to Auschwitz. How did you know? Mm -hmm. How did you know? Who told How you? How did I know? I got a card while I was in the working camp yet. 
where uh, my father wrote me, we are, they are taking us somewhere, I don't know where, and left me, wrote on the card, two addresses, if you survive, turn to these people. As you see, thy father was worried about his son. And son How that, could he send a note to you? How could he know where you were? Well, you could mail, you could get mail from him. Uh -huh. While you were in the unit, uh -huh. you know, you could get mail from home or send mail. And, Did uh, he send that from home? He sent you notes from home? What well, you were in the war and he was at home? Yeah. Uh-huh. So I came to Ungar and uh, went to the to our house, to our building, and uh, nobody lives. Uh, family lived in the back in this building, and we lived in the front, in the second floor, in the uh, very nice big apartment. So then I found out that the Germans used this home as a hospital for the for their uh, injured. And when the guild left, left it all, everything empty. Now you don't know that in 1938, when the Hungarians came in to occupy part of Czechoslovakia that we lived in. They took my father's business license, and we being Jewish. So my father hired a farmer's son, a grown-up. Then under his name, he had to leave, we had a, we had a, he had a business in the front, in the main street, he had to move first to a side street and then his name, this guy's name was on the front. My father was an employer, employee, mm -hmm. but of course he got salary from my father. So the first thing I want to have, see people, I go to that, find out where is this guy. They shall tell me where he lives. I go there, ring the bell, he opens the door, and I see him in my clothes. You know? Oh, wow. That's the, my suits uh -huh. and suit. And, and uh, he was very friendly. You know, friendly. What could, could he do? He was friendly. As a matter of fact, the next day people told me that he had. A, he just brought 200 bicycles into the store. He hid in his father's barn from the Russians, you know. And after the Russians occupied it, then he went and brought it back to the store, you know. But I didn't know what to do. I stayed there, I stayed there a few days. I told him, listen, I all my life I wanted to be a doctor. I don't want to be a businessman. I hope they will come back. I didn't know what happened in Auschwitz yet. You know? You don't know. I just know that they took them there, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, until my father and the family some come back, you handle this store. And you, I am going to Debrecen, to the university, where they have my papers already because I applied there in 1939. Wow. And they didn't take it, but the papers still there, the application. <laughs> so I go there and you send me every month some money to live on. In the meantime, I heard what happened. I. Uh, went back to Debrecen, I started and went to the school, to the university for medicine. 
in medicine and lived in my sister's apartment. When it took one month, two months, nothing from him. So I leave and go back to town. I see half of the store is empty. I say, what, what did you do? He didn't. I said, okay, you get out of here. Apropos, the, the mayor of the town was a Jewish lawyer. He told me, the moment he heard I came back, he told me, listen, he says, I'll give you a, a, a police officer and you go and take away everything what he has, yours, you know. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I didn't want, I wanted him to handle the business. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that he would steal everything and what. Oh, he took he, all the stuff that was in the so store? So I kicked him out and I took somebody else, a guy that used to work for us in the store. Then he opened himself a store. But then I saw him and he didn't have the store. And I told him, go handle the business. And, and then back to school. After a month, again nothing here, I came back. The distance was about, I don't know, a few hundred miles. I used to go by train. Or, but of course you had to go through, always, through border between Hungary and, and Ushorod, because Ushorod became Russia. They were Russian there, but Russian and Hungarian, you know, because my place became Ukrainian, even today on the yeah. map is Hungary, Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And I came back and he stole the other half of the store. <laughs> oh gosh! And a guy comes to me, he says, I, I'm sitting over here, he says, you know, I was with your father when he died. He had some, was sick or something with his legs, you know, like you, huh? and he died. He gave me a letter to give you in case you survive. Wow. You know? Yeah. But when I came over to the Russians, when the Russians freed us, they took our clothes away to, to sterilize the whole, not to get from the, all this lice and everything to clean, and the letter disappears. Oh, you know, all you believe or not, all he did what, because I didn't find anything that I knew that my father had. He was fairly rich, you know. But what can I say? I'm sorry. Oh, he, he said he lost the letter? Huh? He, he lost the letter? Or you ha did you have the letter? Did you have the letter from your father? No. You never got it at all? He got the letter, but he, you got they the letter. took his... He got to he father. Got it. Okay, he claims he took his clothes and they claimed that they never that he never saw Russians it. got it back. Yeah. It, yeah. So anything I had no choice, anything. I met I went to the I met a person, a, a electrician who used to buy in our store all the electric material. He was building high in the houses. You know, to put in electricity, all this, my father was selling all electrical appliances and electric material to. And then from the furniture, I couldn't see anything. He got, he took the furniture, that guy. And this was very beautiful, very heavy, mm -hmm. you know. But I did take away from him, but, uh, Piano, it was a my uh, piano, big piano, like a house. Uh -huh. My sister played the piano, mm -hmm. and I told him, "Listen, there is something left in the store, and the piano, and the Russians let anybody 
who doesn't want to stay in town, he wants to go to Czechoslovakia, you know, because at that time there was Czechoslovakia still, except that what the Russians took away, but it was called Czechoslovakia. Anybody who wants to go there, he can take all his everything and go move there, you know. So he told me that he's going to go there. I said, why don't you buy, take all the things what is here and the piano? You know, I sell it to you. So he gave me a million crowns. A million? A million, which was... How much is that? How much is that? When I took the money, the million crowns, to, to back to Debrecen, I went to the bank. And the banker was a friend of mine. The bank was just across from the, not far where the house was. And I went to him and he gave me $180. Uh, a million crowns is on A million crowns. Wow. So that was Jeez. my brother who was in Israel and Rivka. They thought that I went to school and went to medical school because I took all the richness that I found, you know lived on it. He didn't so the, all I had was a hundred and eighty dollars. Oh. Also hundred and eighty dollars was for mm. one dollar you could go to the market, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, buy for a whole week some food supply. Wow, for the whole week? For a whole week. Wow. For one dollar. Wow. Because one dollar was a million pango or something. It, there was a terrible, uh, until they ch changed the money, or anyway. But then, of course, I couldn't live of that. I started to work uh, on the black market, you know. Somebody told me about it. Somebody did it, and all you had to do is take a truck, and it had to be a Russian truck because nobody else, go to the farmers, the farmers had the tobacco. You bought the tobacco for, I don't know, $150 or something, it was big money. So then you gave a couple hundred dollars to the officer that owned the that we drove with the driver on the truck to take it up to Budapest to the tobacco factory, a cigarette factory, you know? Uh -huh. And then you got 10,000 or 20,000 cigarettes for it. <laughs> and the cigarette was very expensive uh -huh. at that time, you know? <laughs> so, of course, I went through a lot of trouble. I, the first year I didn't go too often to the school, you know, in a college, although you had, they had to sign. The professor in the beginning of semester signed in the book. I have this here. And the end of the semester signed that I was there. But many times I wasn't there. I was on the on one occasion, a guy comes to me in my home and tells me, I have tobacco to, to sell, you know. But this time, I had a partner in Budapest who took the, took the tobacco to the, who got the cigarettes, you know, and he sold and spent sent some money. And this time he sent a truck, you know. Apropos, he f cheated me the hell out of me. But he went, and this guy came, wanted me to come, and he says, but you take only dollars. But the driver of the truck was smart. When he came, he took the dollars and put behind the, the he took out the, light from the truck, the front beam, you know, 
took it and put the money behind it and put it back, you know? Fishy. <laughs> was, he was smart. Before that I didn't have problem with it, but this time I don't know, because I went in Russian. Of course, when I sent with the Russian, I sent that, say, six times, and they went through only two or three times. All the rest just, the Russian just took it and left. You know, never heard about it, but it was... Altogether, I... When we arrived to this location, to get the trigger, there is the police, the police. Nobody was allowed to have dollars, uh -huh. yeah, you know? Uh -huh. But it's not, they didn't want, because of me, because they wanted the dollars. I said, I have no dollars. He said, what do you mean you have dollars? You know that they sell, they sell you only for dollars. No, I said. Give me the tobacco, but tomorrow come to the bank, I give him all the money he needs, it's all cost in uh, Hungarian money. So they took me to the police, the police... Police station. Police station. They made me lay down on my tummy, took off my shoes, my socks, started to hit me on the on my foot, you know, where is the dollar? Where is the dollar? I didn't say, they hit me, the hell. After a while, all night, until they got a little light, then they saw, I won't, they won't break me. They let me go, you know. From all this, after the first year of my medical school, I was thinking, deciding, will I continue to do this black market thing? If they catch me, they put me in jail. Or I will go to medical school. I made $800 from the whole black market that year. So $800, some money, and so I stopped the black market and started to go to school. Okay, I want to ask a question. So why was it illegal to have dollars? Why couldn't you have dollars? Because the moment you have dollars, you have to give it to the government. The government needed the money, the dollars. They wanted it. But the, their money wasn't worth anything. Dollars were. The so dollar was gold. So every dollar that anybody had belonged to them? Every if they find anybody's dollar, they took him in jail, making black marketing. Let's see, if he has dollar, he's a black marketer. Uh -huh, that's the only way to go. No, uh -huh. put him in jail, and, and that I didn't want to do. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> so I made the right choice. Started to go to second year. I went regularly. But of course, to really support myself, I used to go to the hotel casino there. Used to play poker. <laughs> you know, I usually won a little, some money to live on. Mm -hmm. And the eight hundred dollar was on the side, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I did make. I did make. Uh, five years in medical school and sorry my neck hurts but before I did all the examinations but before I get the dip my diploma in March the, the Israeli ambassador whom I visited before in Budapest you know mm -hmm. Send me a note. Uh, the iron curtain is going to drop down. You will never get out of there. Because I told him that my brother is there and I want to go to Israel after I finish. So he said, the iron curtain is going to drop within a month. You know what the iron curtain was. You didn't know. Iron curtain, it was the Russians. Made their... Uh, 
They wouldn't let anybody to get through their occupation, get out or in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chamberlain, not Chamberlain, uh, what's his name? Churchill. Churchill came up with the, called, this, called it Iron Curtain, you know? So I had no choice. I went to my dean. I told him that I am going to graduate. I did all my tests. Graduate in June, which is three months later. I am looking in Budapest for a place where I can intern. For that, I need a note from you that I finished my medical studies, take the examination, June I did be there. And he gave it to me, you know. The funny thing is, the reason he gave it to me because I did him a favor once, you know, he, want, he wanted to put out a book and I gave him a few hundred dollars that he will return it to me until he makes the book. Mm -hmm. And he did bring out the book. Wow. He was an ah, anatomy professor, he was the dean, and he did return my money. Mm -hmm. And did gave me a note. Uh -huh. And with this note, I went to Budapest. And from there to Vienna, when I was three months from there, on boat to Israel in 1949. From 44 to 49, I was in medical school. From 49, I left to. Budapest, Vienna, and then Italy down to the to the hill of Italy, where there was a boat, a, a camp where they connected the Jews. They were escaping, you know, to take to Israel. There was a boat. There's the Exodus. It wasn't the Exodus because during the Exodus, the, the Russia, the the British were still in Israel, you know, they wouldn't let us let off the boat. But it was in 49 and Israel states was declared in 48, you know. So it was free to go by boat and get to Israel. So I went, I went to Israel. When you went to Israel as a Jew, did you think that was that was your only place that you could go where they couldn't kick you out and they couldn't do anything to you? you no, know, first of all, in '48, the Ben Gurion, the governor, the prime minister of Israel, president of Israel, prime minister, he was prime minister. He brought a law: any Jew comes to Israel automatically is citizen of Israel. You know. Every Jew that his, that his mother was Jewish, born to a Jewish mother, you know, he automatically citizen. Israel citizen, you know. So I went in Israel, in Israel, I had little problems because in Israel, of course, I didn't have the diploma yet because I escaped from Hungary with beef. Without a diploma, a medical diploma, as you see, these diplomas are Hebrew. Hebrew and Latin. They gave a diploma in Latin for being, and one in Hebrew. So for that, they were planning on to collect all the medical students that escaped from Europe to Israel, put them in a hospital. Let them work a year then, then they can take the test again. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. And get the diploma from them. Mm -hmm. And so I was first for uh, six months, I worked as a medical aide and uh, in a hospital where we were 
most, most of them were only Jewish soldiers that get paralyzed or something, you know. There was a special hospital for that. So I worked there f until I, they uh, collected the Jews and they told me, now I can go to the hospital. Then I went to the hospital a year internship. I had to go back to Jerusalem to take the, the state board. Then I had to go to work in the, in the, for the nation on the border, villages of Israel as a doctor, as a work for Israel before I go to the Israeli army. I was a year and a half working as a doctor for there for, for after a year they took me to the army. But I was a paratrooper doctor for one year. Usually the, anybody went to the army, male, had to serve three years in the army. But I, used, I served only one year because they considered my work in the border as a work for the, for the government, you know. Mm -hmm. And from then on, that's it. Wow. Then, in the same hospital, I met your mother. <laughs> and then, nine years later, we left to the United States. And here we are. And here we are. <laughs> oh, that's so, that was good. Mm -hmm. That was good. That's a great story.